Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're just going to give it a couple more minutes while we all settle in. Yep. Thanks for coming. It's our third... And final part of our three-part unconference webinar. I'm going to tell you a funny story about how this webinar came about, or actually how the naming convention came about. Um, for lay people who are not poets by training, That's true. we would just name each Zoominar like introduction, one, how to do unconference, second session, how to design the structure of an unconference, and then the third would be like how to enable people to act. Right? Exactly, right. But um, you know, in TBC, we, we have a nice mix of people. There are policy people, private sector people, educators, you know, business people marketing and all that, but then we also have a fair share of poets and um, Paul's not here with us today, but we thought we'll do a shout out because um, sometimes the, people are very exacting. Yeah, um, the, especially when the poet is a public sector person as well. Policy writing. Policy writing, yes, terrible yes. man. Yes, and then, so hence we had to have all the alliterations in our title slides. He actually grumbled when we, when we changed the alliteration. Yes. He was like, nope. There must be alliteration. Because his inner poet soul died. Yeah, his but inner poet soul shriveled and died. But you see, the thing about the unconference is, you know, we generally, we, whoever comes are the right people, is the right people. So we kind of accommodate. And I think, you know, if it's, if it's no skin off my nose to, to alliterate all my titles, yeah. so be it. Because, you know, we, we don't always have to agree or disagree or agree or disagree to agree or agree or disagree. I think the beauty yeah. of an, an unconference or an open space or you know, what we call the open space technology is that there is a space for everyone's voice. And I think the beauty is when we can accommodate how people feel in a manner that I think doesn't take away from any one of us. I think um, that's really the spirit of, of the unconference. And so to kick things off, we're going to actually do our third Zoominar today which is on agency and action. The first week, we talked about introduction and inclusion. The second was on structure and serendipity. We'll unpack those again and review those for those of you who missed it. Um, but just kind of see, uh, kind of see how those stack um, before we, we really get into the meat of agency and action. Um, and so I'm Sheree, and I'm going to be half of the show today. Actually, I'm less than half the show. That's, that's it's, Nigel. Okay. No, fine. no, it wasn't about that. It's because it's, we have everybody else here who is the other third, and then some, so... Okay, so, right. Uh, so, I guess I'm one third of the show today. Hi, I'm Nigel. Uh, you may have remembered me from the first webinar. <clears throat> so, great, we're gonna just going to jump right in. Um, you know, in the conference, when you think of, like, people coming together, like-minded people coming together, you know, we, we attend a conference, for example, everyone kind of knows what to expect. So, they kind of go in with kind of like the same vibe almost, right? But in an unconference, the, the whole beauty of it is that it's very open, like anything could happen. And so we're gonna, you know, on that queue, we're gonna start off with a really exciting um, connecting activity, and I'm gonna get Nigel to do yeah. that. So Nikki, we just get, get to the next slide. Um, you will see in, on your slides, just give it some time, a Singapore map. And we're we, gonna do a we, very Singaporean activity. Is, is Nikki activity. sharing the slides? Or are we sharing the slides? Nikki is sharing the slides. Okay, we'll just give her some time. But you'll see a Singapore map, and then what I want you to do is kind of orientate yourself with the map when you see it on your screen, and kind of figure out where on that map you are, okay? Are we good to go with the, with the slides? No? The slides should be visible to everyone. Is it? Can someone give me a thumbs up if you can see it? It's not, it's not coming on my screen. Great. All right. Okay. Okay, the map's there. Okay, I can't see the map on my screen, so maybe the studio people can help me out here. Okay, but, hey, so I'm just going to go as though I can see the map. Okay, so if you can see the map in front of you, you will see that we have color-coordinated all the different parts of the map. So can you just kind of eyeball where you are on that map? Okay? We don't need to do anything just yet, but just kind of eyeball um, where you are on that map. Right. Okay? And then I'm just going to give you more instructions. Okay. So if you have... If you have located roughly where you are on the map, this is a simple activity, very close to my heart. You are going to tell me, or tell all of us here, where your favorite ch chicken rice stall is. So if you use the annotate function on your Zoom, you should mark out maybe with your initials or like a, I don't know, a heart shape or something yeah. um, of where your favorite chicken rice stall is located, uh, okay? For, for those of you who are Chinese or understand Hokkien, ah, 
唔是那鸡啊，鸡饭 ，chicken rice。For those of you who don't speak Singlish, what he means is that please remember that we're looking for Singaporean Hainanese chicken rice stall or a kind of similar equivalent. Please mark that out on your Google on your、um, Zoom map, please. I see one heart、yeah. shape in the north. That's not quite the nuance of what I, what I said in Hokkien. But it's okay. But that's that's what we're go- that's what we're go- that's what we're going with. Okay, that's what we're going with. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. So we, we see.、Um, I see one. Oh, I see a few stars in the central area. Oh. I uh huh.、Oh. I I approve. I would put mine there too. But mine is my favorite chicken rice stall is in Serangoon Gardens. But Serangoon Gardens,、mm. there's chicken rice there. Yes, yes.、Oh. To be honest, I mean it's not the best, but I grew up eating there, so there's nostalgia and nostalgia adds a whole different umami to the chicken rice as far、right. as I'm concerned. But、um, okay, so we have most people. Oh, one person is in Ang Mo Kio. I see. Nice. Okay, we kind of have a mix of where everybody's favorite chicken rice stall is. But Nigel, yes, you pick chicken rice, right? It's not very inclusive, you know. But chicken rice is practically our national dish. No, it's not. Let's not、oh, go. Let's not go there because、oh, okay. that's an unconference unto itself. What the national dish is. Yeah, that's、um, true. But okay,、um, can one of you just kind of share where specifically you had placed and why you like the chicken rice store? Justin, Justin loves food. Maybe I can arrow him for a bit. Oh, okay, sure. So actually, I, the the location I put was somewhere around. City Hall area, Purvis Street, where I think there's a whole、uh, string of Hainanese restaurants and cafeterias.、Uh, and、uh, I think when I was younger, my 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 family,、uh, my mom's side of the family is Hainanese, so we go around that area for for chicken rice.、Uh, it may not be the best, but I guess it's a just familiar area,、uh, and and it's it's just a memory that、uh, it's something I will always go to when I want to have a、uh, chicken rice. Yeah. Let me guess. Let me guess. Was it this small little store on Purvis Street called Yit Corn? Yit Corn. Yat corn. That was one of them. Ah. Cause got chin chin also. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yes, yes. Great, but I mean the reason why I brought up about chicken rice is because vegetarians how? Oh yeah, vegetarians how? I'm sorry, vegetarians. Um, any vegetarians in the midst of us that struggle to? Oh really? Do you put a chicken rice order? So um. Uh, by the way, I was the one who jumped the gun and put the heart up in the very north of Woodlands because that's where I live,、nice. and I, I, I feel pride, you know, and I want, and I feel Woodlands is often overlooked, so that's why I put the heart.、Um, oh, and、I、today、see. we opened a new ta- Thompson East Coast line, so we can. Nice. It's our life has、uh, gotten better.、Um, so my wife and I've been trying to go to this place in Algon called Boneless Chicken, which, which, whose I think their only dish is.、Uh, Vegan chicken rice, but we haven't made it there yet. But so I,、oh, I put、awesome. a check. I put a check、oh. in Algong. I didn't put a heart because I can't swear by it yet. How does that work? So it's vegan chicken rice. So it's fake chicken. Mushroom. Are we going to a philosophical question about no, what makes、okay. a chicken? But okay, it doesn't matter. Okay, okay. So anyway, can we just can we just erase the the annotate the annotate map? Pick another food item. Uh, okay. Let's go with. Well, we're on we're on camera, so I have to use English, I guess. Let's go with carrot cake. Are we talking about? Cai、like, tao kui. Ah, okay. Clarification. Okay, very important. In these connecting activities, if you're playing in your own open space technology, please make sure you clarify because carrot cake very nebulous. You play with a slightly more mixed crowd, you can get Martha Stewart carrot cake or really like Zion Road carrot cake. Then you know it becomes like black white. But where is your favorite carrot cake? Carrot cake stall, or if you are,、um, you feel like you, you're not into the local carrot cakes and you want to put a baked Martha Stewart type carrot cake, that's fine too. And then we will we'll unpack that as well. We're very inclusive here. Can can I? I can't see.、Um, yeah. So if you have a favorite, ooh, Chang Changi, Changi,、mm, heart shape somehow. It's not just a star.、Yeah. I like. Can can we see everybody else's carrot cake? Oh, there's one in Queenstown. Oh, that's pretty near where we are. Okay. For Samba- breakfast today, had, for breakfast today, I had some incredible carrot cake from the Lok Blanga. Is that where you're gonna put yours? If you had to put a. If I had to put a star, that's the best carrot cake. Nice, nice. Okay, can we just have one person share their favorite carrot cake? Sherilyn. Well, thinking of Sidelis. Ah,、uh, I see. Ah, so it. So does it? Is do you have a favorite Sedeli? 
Uh, Novena Square. So easy, mm. reading rich. So, so yours is Western Carrot Cake. Yeah, I that to came to mind. Yeah, that came to mind. I should do a disclaimer that none of these hawker stalls or Sedeli for that matter have paid us to advertise for them, okay? So this is truly like, I'm just stating it, yeah. just stating it out there, okay? <laughs> also, that is interesting. I, I'm not a big uh, Western carrot cake fan, but my favourite like Chinese carrot cake is it is, is the one at Holland because the uncle can make it black black. Oh, I I, like. I'm, I'm a white carrot cake kind of guy. Has to be a little bit crispy, right, right amount of the... Uh, radish in it. You yeah. can't see this. People in the studio are nodding. I'm like, mm, no, I like mine like soggy, wet and sweet. You're in luck. We still have one packet of, of black carrot cake. <sighs> see, this is why you must be nice to your studio team. They buy you food. But okay, but the reason why I wanted to start with this was because, I mean, really a simple connecting activity like this, which we, we kind of talked about in the intro, intro to an unconference, um, makes it a, you know, kind of an easy way for people to kind of break the ice. Everyone has an opinion about food. If you come to Singapore, you, you live in Singapore. So it's always a safe one to play. Um, I think we had some facilitators share um, in Zoomina 1 that the Singapore map activity, whether in person, where you can literally have them move around the room, um, or like we do in Zoom, um, it's actually a great way for people to just kind of, kind of, I, I guess, break the ice, right? Much as sometimes we don't like the, the phrase, um, to just kind of relax a little bit and ease into the idea that they have um, an agency where they can decide yeah. what they want and take action. So this is a very simple way of kind of looking at agency and action. So we, we take it back to seminar, um, into Zoomina 1. Um, you will see that we covered these two things. And, you know, because Nigel did Zoomina 1, I'm going to pass the time to him to kind of oh, take us okay. through okay. a review of Zoomina 1. So, Zoom, so Zoomina 1, we talked about in, introductions and inclusions. And so a simple... A simple um, uh, introductory activity like that map is really a good way to get different people who come from different places for for your un, for your open space technolo technology event uh, to just get to know a little bit about each other. Uh, so and and the topics that you pick are ones that are com that you try to be as inclusive as possible and um, get people to in interact on ve on very very safe topics. So. We chose food. We chose food earlier because it's close to many Singaporeans' hearts. Um, but we have done other things like, you know, well, where where did you go to school? Uh, where 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 did you go? Where did you go for your for your first? Um, I don't know. Where where do you learn to drive a car? Stuff stuff like that. So it gets people to introduce each other, and more importantly, to um, get comfortable with expressing themselves. And expressing themselves to different to different people, which they may not have met before. Can we have the next slide, please? No. Yeah. Yeah. So once once you have these uh, connecting activities, usually we try, for me personally, I I like to try and make them a little bit funny so that people get to lighten up a bit and the and the mood of the room is nice. That that's when because people are, are getting a bit comfortable, we can we can start uh, talking about. What do we expect from this session in terms of the group norms? What are, what, what are the positive behaviours that would help us have, have a great time at this, at this particular conference or, or event? And, and, and when we talk about that, remember in, at Zoomina 1, we, talk, we talked about setting group norms and most importantly, getting everybody to agree on those particular group norms. And why this is important is really on that third point of inclusion. Because if, if you come up with, with, with a group of norms and not everybody agrees, but just the majority, then you literally have a situation where you have the tyranny of the majority, which is really, really bad because then some people will feel that they aren't included at all and, and that may create a, a negative vibe and that's really not something that we want to do at all. Okay, so... On group norms and inclusion, it's very important that everybody is on board with the group norms so that they feel that they are part of this. And on, and on the third section of, of, crea of creating that, that open space, well, actually, you've kind, of, you've kind of done that already, haven't you? Once you've gotten people com comfortable with each other, talking to each other, once you've, you've gotten them to agree about how we would like the day to go, that, 
that's really when you've already started creating the open space and you're ready to start into that work and start talking about the, nat the nature of the unconference and how you can introduce the ideas that you want to talk about and see who else is interested. So really, that was that first portion of introduction and inclusion. Yep, Sherry, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, we're good. So can you just kind of just go through for people who maybe didn't join us for one and two, which is what is an unconference again? All right. And why this, you know, structure serendipity and all that add to creating this open space? Okay, so an unconference is, is really a term used to, to express what is more broadly known as, op as open space technology. Uh, I hate using this term, but I'm using it anyway. But in a nutshell, it is an event which is pretty much the opposite of a regular conference, hence the word unconference. You, it is an inside-out <coughs> tea break because in a regular conference, you, there are set, set portions of the program. There is a set speaker, set topics, and you go in not always want, wanting to uh, listen to all of it, but you have to go be polite and listen anyway. And the best parts of those conferences are really when when during the tea breaks where you interact and network and talk to each other. An unconference is an entire conference that is a tea break. So you get, you get to interact and talk about the stuff you want. Um, it is a conference with no conference rules. Okay, I lie a little bit. There are some guidelines. There are some guidelines to how, to how an unconference works. But why we say there are no rules, as mentioned earlier, it's not one where you know exactly what's going to happen, where you know that there is a keynote speaker who's going to talk about this, there are three uh, plenary sessions and whatnot. No, it doesn't work that way. The reason why we say it is a conference with no rules is because you create the program for, for the day. And the rules are the rules that the group comes up with during the group norms. So it's not so much that there are no conference rules, but rather the rules are created by the participants, which leads to the third point about participant designed and, and participants design and lead the conference. So this is where in a previous session we talk about the marketplace of ideas, but in short, what it what it is is the participants who attend the event are the ones who decide what are they interested in, what they want to talk about. And they just pitch the idea out and see who else wants to talk about it. Because that way you get to, you get to come to an event where you get to talk or discuss about a topic that matters to you. Which is why we have this fourth point of this important open marketplace of ideas. So, un so open space technology events and conferences are great places for you to want to test out an idea or point of view, or if you wanted more input on something, or if you feel something's really important that needs to be said, you can check out whether other people share that same view with you, and then you gather a small group and bounce ideas off each other. It's fantastic. And that's also really why I think the idea of structure um, matters to a degree, because when you kind of have an open marketplace, um, for a lot of people, it can feel like a little bit, like, a bit chaotic, right? So how, like, conceptually, so it's important to have some measure of structure and that gives rise to serendipity. And we'll talk about that structure in just a moment. But also behind the whole idea of a marketplace, an open marketplace is the idea of agency. It's for people to come and say, this is what is important to me. Right? This is what I want to talk about. And this is what they're putting forth. Um, it's not always true that an, you know, you, an unconference means they have to land on an action. Um, it doesn't mean that they have to achieve some sort of like, okay, what deliverables and what we must we do in the two weeks after an unconference. But really, the idea of agency facilitates that. When people feel like they um, have their voice matters, um, it's, a good, it's a great place for us to start. And for us to do that, we really look at the unconference rules. Um, so in the next slide we have, you will see that un in an unconference, there are kind of four principles and one law, right? And we're just going to take you through them um, and kind of unpack them a little bit for you. The first one is really whoever comes is the right people. Um, sometimes in your mind, in a, in, a, in a traditional conference, you're like, oh, I want this sort of people from this government agency or, or that company or you know, all the managers or executive levels. And there's a real idea of who needs to come. Um, but as you know, for example, in a leadership conference, for example, sometimes 
you know, they're allowed to invite people who might be next-gen leaders, but really that can come at many levels and at any level. And the unconference open space takes a different take to it and says, if you feel like you want to attend a leadership, even though you're not in a specific strata or you bears a title, you should come too because, you know, you exercise your agency and you come and you will always learn something new, discover something new, be exposed to something different. Um, there's always something to take away if you come with that spirit. Um, so the idea of whoever comes as the right people um, is really what we talk about um, with, that, with that. So the next slide, you'll see that in our first Zoom in of inclusion, um, next slide, please, you will see that this covers really who, who comes are the right people. In Zoom in 2, we looked at two other things, structure and serendipity. It feels very ethical, right? Structure feels like if it's, it's there are these rules and there are, you know, there are guidelines and then serendipity feels like, oh, it needs to just kind of happen organically. It'll happen and um, it'll be fine. Um, and it leads <laughs> us to actually the other three principles of the unconference. The first one being whatever happens is all that could have happened. Um, there have been unconferences that we have, I've attended where we all think as, as people who plan it, right? Like, oh, we'll talk about these. I think these 10 topics are, are going to dominate and we kind of prep yeah. for that, we read up, you know, we, we ensure there's enough flipchart paper and all that. And then really when the participants come, they want to talk only about two things. And then they want to kind of break down these two things. Um, and you're like, oh, do we, do we then throw out the other eight? Do I kind of plant people to, to talk about the other eight topics? No, in an unconference, you, will, you trust the system, right? Um, I know Doug's here today and Doug loves this line, says trust the process because what's important will surface and what will happen is all that could happen. If the, un if the unconference really only talked about these two main things and that's what people just really wanted to, to work on, discuss, explore, dialogue, vent, then that's, that's what's important to them. Right? And, and, and I think it's, it's also good learning because when you, plan an, an, when you plan a conference, you always have a team going, this is what I think people want to learn, this is what I think people need to know, this is what I think should happen. But I think when you look at the ground um, and the unconference being very ground up, we have a very, very different program um, at the end of the day. Right? So that, that really is, that covers the idea of the structure and serendipity. Then we have when it starts is when it starts. Yes. Um, again, again, generally, if you say 2 p.m., we kind of start at 2 p.m. Um, but an unconference really starts when people start entering a space because they're talking to each other and, and things like this. So um, when it starts, is when it starts. And then when it ends, it's when it ends. Um, when you look at these four principles, it kind of guides where we are. So as mentioned, you know, in, in our second seminar, we really covered group norms, which Nigel has talked about. Um, you don't have to call it group norms. Some people just call it ways of being. Some people don't have a very formal setting. They, they could do it in, in, in more game fashion or in a connecting activity that's really up to, to you and the team that's running the conference. Um, but I think there are a few core things that we want to remind people that it should always be a safe space, right? So the idea that, for example, if things that come out are like mental health or mental wellness, right, then the idea of safety and, and, and security comes in, right? and the idea of inclusiveness. And how do we do that? We do that by really looking at, for example, just the ethos of why they came, but also, also confidentiality, right? And, and what that means. And it's a little bit different. It's not just the idea of, I'll just keep your secret. Um, and so that's one. So confidentiality is really one. And then the second, the, the next one is really about dialogue and not debate. Um, you'll notice that I, I mean, for me personally, when I, when I run on conferences, um, I tend to do that in, um, countries outside of, of Singapore where they may not always speak the same language. They're, they're very, um, they're, they're not homogenous in terms of makeup. I, I work with, with political groups that, are, that argue anyway. And I think the one thing that I, I, I always try and say is I, I don't want to discuss because discussion feels like we must all kind of agree on something. Um, and that kind of goes against the spirit of what a conference is. The, the beauty of it is it allows us to hold different opinions even opposing one, dissenting ones in, in a space because it's really about dialogue, right? Um, and then we'll talk about, when we talk about agency today, we will we'll, we'll, we'll kind of link back to that as well. But I wanted to just kind of highlight a slide that Douglas and I talked about in our second Zoom webinar, which is on confidentiality. Um, it's a level one, level two, level three. Um, I say this to teachers and educators when I, I speak with them. I, it's the same thing in the office. Um, I teach them to my kids. Um, because these days, you know, when they blurb on Facebook or TikTok or whatever, it's, it's there forever. But there are really three levels of confidentiality and really in, in your setup of your, your group norms or your, your ways of being, you kind of want to cover these things. 
I still do it very explicitly. Um, there are very, very few rules when I, I run any facilitation, but I just kind of leave it out there. I don't um, dictate what we should be, mm -hmm. but I do say that there are three levels. Level one being a very open for all. You can share and share accurately, meaning I can say, oh, I met Nigel today at this unconference and he told me this story about his favourite cha kui tiao and or chai tao kui, and he said whatever. It's, it's kind of open for all. These are not things that are all to Nigel very, very secretive or things that he is happy to share about. So that's what makes a level one kind of confidentiality. Level two is you share the story, but not the name. So it's kind of like an abstract sharing. It's like, oh, I met this guy at the conference, the older Chinese dude um, or younger Chinese dude. And then he, we were talking about food and he feels that his favorite Chai Takui place is, I, I don't know, Telok Blanga, for example. So again, it's very abstract. Now, level two is always where Mm, it can get a little bit dicey. For example, if I say, so I met this guy at this unconference. Um, I, I won't really mention his name, but he, he's a, a, a contractor. He's got curly hair, mole on his face, wears yellow boots. Um, that that kind of defeats um, level two as well. Because if you, if you kind of point out and people can kind of like, oh, I, I know the guy. I won't say, you won't say, lah, but we all know who the person is. That also defeats level two. So the idea of it is when you hold space for someone at level two, you must really just forgo the person's identity and just stick to the message or the story that this person has told. Then there's level three, um, which for a lot of people, actually, they struggle with uh, two and three. Level three is like an absolute vault. Human nature feels like when I find, I hear something juicy or exciting, I want to tell somebody, right? But a level three confidentiality really is you will listen and you will hold your peace, which means you do not go and blog it on Facebook after the session and go, oh, I met this guy and he said X, Y, Z because that might be something that he never ever wants and he's, he's um, speaking to a very safe space. So again, confidentiality creates that safety. It allows people to feel like, um, to be honest, it's a, it's a sacred space um, where they, they share. So you can always set it up and say, you know, guys, we're going to assume everything here is um, a level one or a level two. Um, but please say if it's a level three if, if, for example, you want to share something. So I think it's, it's something that you want to be upfront about as well. If you're doing your um, unconference on Zoom like we are, or we're going to do next month, please also declare if you're going to be recording. Right? So that's, that's the other way of kind of clarifying that people's faces will appear. So it naturally makes it a, a level one kind of setup anyway. Right? Yeah. So. Uh, normally when it comes to confidentiality, it usually comes up as part of the group group norms. Um, but if it doesn't come up, um, as the he person heading this particular event, it's important then that you highlight the idea of confidentiality to all the participants and see where, and see where they stand on this particular thing, on this particular issue. So normally it will come up during group norms, but if it doesn't, then you as, then you as the person leading the event should bring it up and then, and then talk to the rest of the group wh where the default level is. And, and once again, like the rest of the group norms, ensure that everybody agrees with it. And that if, say, for example, the default level is level two, but give people the option to choose level three if they are sharing a particularly sensitive story or, or experience they may have had. So I think it, the, the reason why we have these structures is because we don't know what's coming up, right? So we want to create as safe a space um, as we can to facilitate a conversation. To be honest, if you do it on Zoom, it's a lot easier because when they enter a room, it'll be like, recording is in progress. So they, they kind of know that it's, a, it's at level one anyway. Um, but if you're doing this in person, and I, I really hope in person on conferences um, come back because they're, they're really magical to attend. Um, it's something that I, I make an effort to, to kind of um, remind the group um, but also randomly, I'll, I will say, sometimes persons like, oh, you know, remember guys, we're at level two now or like we're at level three now or level one now. Um, and after a while, I mean, the powerful thing about this is they themselves take back these levels and, and hopefully they use it in their workplace, their homes, because I think the more people understand that there are different levels, um, it, it helps to hold space anyway, whether it's between a group or between two people, right? So... Um, that really covers um, serendipity and structure, right? So if you um, next slide, you can see um, one more down. Um, you will see that the kind of four principles kind of cover these four. At this juncture, I just want to ask the, the groom, is there anyone who wants to add anything at this moment? Um, 
Yes, Doug. Yes. Don't have to sneak one in. I give you the floor. Yeah. So, uh, so it actually occurred to me as I was, I was listening to you, it's kind of a, a new connection. So, you know, as, as Nigel said, this idea inside out tea break that many people would have experienced uh, a lot a lot of uh, benefit from a conference, not during the sessions, but during tea break, lunch, before and after. Um, but then when this unconference open space got created, you can't really do this thing where you just say, okay, we're just going to meet whoever wants to show up and then make random connections. That's like almost chaos, right? So it wouldn't it wouldn't normally create a lot of, of good connections. It would be quite random. Um, so that's how this guy, Harrison Owen, that started, created the structure, right, of where people do the marketplace and do the stuff that they've been talking about. And it reminds me of a word that was created by this guy, D. Hawk, who uh, created Visa International, the credit cards, and he created a new word um, and wrote books about it. And the word is called chaotic. So it's chaotic. like a bit chaotic. chaos and a bit order. And together, it's actually, it's really a, a structure and serendipity in some ways, right? Because mm. there's enough order to allow, to, to sort of manage the energy and the chaos. I just think it's a lovely word. Um, I, 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 like how the, I don't know if our policy poet would. Oh, would I was uh, just going to, I was yeah. just going to say, <laughs> the linguist will create a new word called chaotic. A cha chaotic. <laughs> Are you listening, public servant <laughs> poet? I like that. Anything with chaos even hinted in it, I know it would make most public. <laughs> but it's chaotic. Chaotic. Nice, nice. Awesome. Can I just can I just bother someone to just type it into the chat group so that we all remember to go and check out the book? Thank you, Douglas. I I, I love I love that. I love that. But when we when we look at all the four principles, I mean this is really why we spend so much time setting it up. Um in a in a facilitation um even in a conference situation, you would kind of have some rules. Um, and there's some things that carry forward. Just that in a conference, you don't have to worry about serendipity because everything is planned. Um, but in an unconference, sometimes just kind of knowing the OB markers helps everybody to feel a little bit safer. Um, and so we want to just kind of move into um, what we're going to talk about today, which is agency and action. There is a wonderful law at the bottom, if you see, it's a law of two feet or the law of mobility. Um, and it really means, because in, in a physical unconference, you will be going to different rooms. Firstly, you would use your feet to stand up and say, this is what I want to talk about. But you'll be using your feet to kind of go to the rooms that pique your interest or the rooms that you have come up with and people are going to come and, and meet you. And that's why we say the law of two feet, right? I mean, and people would then uh, be visiting rooms. Again, sometimes the, I mean, an ideal on conference, people come in and they go out and no one feels offended. So I come in, I listen to Nigel, he's talking and I'm like, ah, you know, what? I, I've heard this, not really my thing, then you move to another room. Kind of like window shopping until you find something you want to buy. Uh, again, for a lot of crowds in, in, in this part of the world, especially, um, I mean, my experience is in, in ASEAN mainly, I always kind of have to ring a bell and like, guys, if you want to move rooms now, you can, because sometimes people feel bad. So. Um, you gotta kind of read your audience. I, I do it. I always ring a bell because I know people feel um, they, they, they feel, feel they have to be very polite yes. and be rude to leave. Yeah. Um, so I think that's something that you, you kind of want to do, and that allows for agency and action. The moving around, the choosing of rooms, that in itself is a sense of agency, right? And 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 um, and that's really what we start with. So, and so I just want to unpack the law of mobility yes. first. So the law of mobility, it sounds really fancy. It sounds even a little scary because in the unconference, we say there are four principles. And if you notice, there's only one law. So now I am going to invite my good friend, Akor, to explain this in layman's terms. <coughs> Hi, I am Akor, Nigel's good friend. You listen, you hear about Open space technology. Sounds very sophisticated. Now come, there is one law. It is actually very simple. Earlier you heard there was the marketplace of ideas, right? Means got many, many rooms. So you pick a room, you go inside to the room. When you enter the room, you listen to the people talking and you contribute. But if you feel that this is not quite the room you want to be in. 
Then you use your two feet and walk to another room that you want to go to, that you feel you will contribute best. It is very simple. That's why that it is the only law, the law of two feet. And that is all I have to say about it. Thank you. And that was my friend Akor, um, who really loves going to unconferences and walking from walking from room to room to, to get a taster and a feel of, of what the different ideas may be. And what's important about this law is really giving people that sense of control, that sense of agency, that sense of choice, that when, that when you decide to go to one particular topic, you're not locked into that room if the conversation or discussion or the narrative in that room is going in a direction that you feel you can contribute best in. If, if you feel that, then feel free to pick any of the other rooms where exciting discussions are going on and check out that room and, and see whether it's something that you would feel would be the best place for you to be in and grow from. Sherry, would you like to talk a bit more about that? Um, I think the sense of agency, um, when, when I first heard it many, many years ago, people always like, they get confused, right? Because when you say, oh, what is agency? Uh, and you always think like, oh, super agent, or you think, you know, insurance agent. Um, you know, there are all these connotations to what agency is. And I, I've actually spoken to several people on like, can we find a better, more commonplace word for it? Um, but it, it's, it's a fairly, um, it's getting a bit more commonplace, so that maybe it helps. But let's just kind of talk about what a sense of agency is. A sense of agency is really the feeling that you can control your own action. And because you can control your own action, you can influence events in the external world. A sense of agency is not limited to a conference or an unconference or at work or to adults. Um, a sense of agency is also what you want to imbue in, in children, in students, in young people, because you also want them to feel like what they do is of their, their own volition and what they do has impact, mm. right? Um, we're not saying a sense of agency is always purely a positive one because it can be, uh, the idea is you can, it can be applied nefariously as well. Um, but the idea that you, you can make your own decision and that decision has impact on somebody else, has impact on the world, has impact on what happens, um, kind of saying, I mean, the easy way of saying is that choices have consequences, but you can, you have the right and I guess the, the means to make that choice. And the sense of agency is really the hallmark of an unconference because an unconference is predicated on people desiring to come on their own, not arrowed by their boss um, or, you know, here because they want to hear some fancy keynote speaker. Uh, um, and our conferences also had the agency of coming up with their own topics. There are going to be a lot of people in your conference who might like, ah, you know, I, I don't even want to come up with a topic. That's also fine. Mm. They, they have exercised that choice to not um, make a choice. Um, but it also then, the next time they have a sense of agency is in attending right, yeah. one of the rooms or the breakout rooms that they want, um, or not attending and deciding to hang out in the main hall to chat about something else or random things. Um, and the third, the fourth one, is having an agency in that space. Let's say I've gone to a breakout room to then contribute and yeah. allow, um, you know, to, to receive um, new information, new, new dialogue and, and things like that. So this is the agency kind of runs through um, the very premise of, of an unconference and which is why we, we wanted to spend a whole session today just kind of talking about it. In fact, I'm going to jump in very quickly and talk a little bit more about the agency in relation to the earlier sessions that we had about the unconference. So we talked about whoever comes is the right people. For me personally, at an open space event like the Unconference, it's important that people come to the event willingly and as Sherry mentioned, they aren't arrowed or forced to come because that kind of removes that sense of agency from them, doesn't it? So that's one. Ideally, people should sign up for the event or come for the event willingly, not because they have to as part of meeting some... Uh, key performance indicator or, or, or training requirement or whatever. So that's one on agency. The second area on agency I would like to talk about is sometimes as an event organizer, when, when you do the marketplace of ideas, um, some of us have this tendency of we must have order and structure and you, and you start grouping, force grouping everybody together into, in, into one topic to go into one room without actually checking in with the people who propose the ideas. 
uh, whether are they comfortable with that grouping. Um, and, that happen and, and that happens a lot in, in many events that I've attended. I would say that uh, this is actually something that we have to be very aware of because if you force group, pe group people, you are again taking away their, their agency. And for the people who propose the, idea, propose the ideas, they go, I wanted to talk about this, but now you've grouped me with all these people. That's not quite what I wanted to do. And, and so as a result of which, they feel a bit let down by the whole, by the whole process. So agency is at its core probably one of the most important things that ha that happens during an unconference. One of the most beautiful stories I've heard recently. I mean, I've got I've got three boys, um, and I think sometimes as a as a mother, it, it, I feel like I want to push my kids to just do a little bit more. And, and someone told me a wonderful story just um, yesterday um, about a dad and his his son who were supposed to take a roller coaster ride. I thought of of um, Nigel's wife because she loves roller coasters. And the dad says to the son, um, and this was an overheard conversation, the dad says to the son, you know, it's, it's very brave to go on a roller coaster ride. But it's also very brave to say you don't want to go on a roller coaster ride. Um, so I think the idea that you can choose and make a decision that impacts, you know, a follow up action or something else um, is, is very, very empowering. And to have a space that I guess celebrates it, that is predicated on it, is, is a very powerful and truly giving environment. For example, in a lot of unconferences, physical unconferences, we will always have breakout rooms. If it's more adultish, sometimes there's a bar, sometimes there's ping pong table, table tennis, sometimes there's carom board, sometimes there's cards. Because who's to say that when I'm playing cards with Nigel, I'm not having a deep discussion about what matters to me or what matters to him, right? Um, so I think the idea is, is and of an unconference is how do we create this open spaces, like literal open spaces, whether it's on a Zoom breakout room or a physical corner or in the kitchen in your house where people can have conversations that matter to them, right? Uh, which kind of brings us back. And why do we do this? Because it is the best way to build brain trust, heart trust and hand trust in, 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 our, in our lives and in Singapore. So we're going to just really dip, deep dive into how then can we create things that gives us a sense of agency. So I've come up with this very cute tree and it's obviously colour-coded, so it's a little bit lead, but just go with me here, I've thought about this. Um, there are a few things that kind of build this tree, right? So at, in the roots, uh, you'll see that we have the group norms that kind of feed this, this, this tree, um, inclusion um, of, of people and creating that safe space. Um, we have structure, you know, whether it's, it's how it's done or where people go, you know, people kind of know. Um, in a physical unconference, you would have a market base of ideas, like a wall behind you that would have people sticking post-its, for example, or paper up. Um, so that structure and then serendipity is, you know, you, magic can happen anywhere. And all this kind of leads to people having an unconference experience. And I would say that most unconferences always, they still surprise me. I mean, there's always something that happens, but you kind of get five types of people that attend. Um, the two grey ones, less so in the unconference, if you, if you are not arrowed to go, but you see them sometimes in conferences. The first one is what I call the cog wheel. The cog wheels are people who come and they're like, Hi, I'm just a cog wheel in the machine, I can't change anything, I come so I just listen. Um, you know, it's not of any big impact. So they really come because someone told them to come, they come because their boss sent them, they have to clock a KPI because, you know, they want free food, I don't know. Right, so these are people whom in that sense, have a very low sense of agency. And perhaps, depending on the setting, if it's a normal conference and you're really about the numbers, then fine, right? It doesn't really matter. A bit sad, lah, but you know, if you feel you're a cogwheel, then there's a very little sense of agency. Then you have what I call the underminers, the kind who will listen and then go, oh, yeah, I don't want to be coming on, Nigel. It's not like we, they're going to change anything. They talk, 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 and then they never do anything anyway. In you modern know? language, we call them trolls. Right, so the, the underminers are, are the other people that you would get in, um, again, less so in unconference, which is why you should be running unconferences, but more so in traditional ones, because they also feel like, oh, yeah, no la, cannot la. You know, and you get that a lot, right? I mean, if you see them on, I guess, comment pages, you, you get a lot of that. And then we start moving into like the, the yellow pink zone. Um, you get the maybe still can. The maybe still can people are the ones that go, oh, I guess maybe mm. we try, like, we try. I'll just, I, I come and see how and then maybe got, got, got chance, you know. Um, and those are the ones that maybe are a bit more sceptical. They are curious, but they have never, they don't really feel a big 
sense of, 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 of agency in terms of possibility. And the fact that they are attending something like an unconference is really good for this particular category of maybe yeah. still can because then they, they are relatively open to the possibilities. They meet other people who are, who are in the same sta stage that they are in and they realise, hey, I'm not alone in the maybe still can. So if there are enough maybe still cans, then maybe can do something. Yes. So which is also why in the physical unconference, you want to have as many kind of like different spaces for people to have their extended tea breaks because magic happens in, in the funniest corners. And a lot of these maybe still can type people find and move into the next category of what I call the possibilist. Right? The possibilists are people who are like, okay, it's possible. I'm not quite sure how, yep. but it's possible. Even if we just have a dialogue about it, we, we change mindset, okay, it's, it's possible. Um, and you get a lot of them. I think most of the unconferences um, that I've attended are filled with the possibilist. They are they're great because they can be very critical and they can be very uh, sceptical. But at the same time, there's a real sense of, I guess, measured optimism um, of that there is possible, yeah. right? So um, you're moving them closer on the spectrum of higher agency, but also closer to agency and maybe can take action. Yeah. The beautiful thing about an unconference is that for these, for these people, the possible is they will have, we can do it. I'm just not, not sure how. But they meet other people whom when, when they go into their, breakout, into their breakout rooms to share their idea and discuss and talk about it, that's when they start going over the, possibil the possibilities and then com coming up to the realisation that, hey, actually, it's possible. And there'll be other people who will help fill in that missing gaps to help that idea germinate and go in and move into something that can be done. Yes, which takes us to kind of like the, I mean, I, 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 say I use the word ideal category, but this is the kind of people that, um, just one slide back, please, um, called the change maker. The change maker is the people who are, who are going to come and like, okay, I just want to dialogue, I want to talk, learn, meet people, because I feel like I can really impact my external world. So these are people very high on agency, Sometimes it's because they have experience in making changes, they have experience in open space. These are the guys that you would see are very excited about open space because then they know they can help shape um, agendas, for example, or they can help you know, air what they feel um, that leads to an action. So I would say the yellow and pink zone from the maybe still can possibilists and change makers are the people that you traditionally get um, or the bulk of the unconferences will be in this category. Um, they just need different, I guess, different s structures uh, for their serendipity to happen, right? But these are the, the three things and where we want to move as many people, not just in an unconference, but in life, from the grey zone to the pink zone, um, to, to kind of to move there. Again, if you meet someone in an unconference and they're like, oh, the change maker type, it doesn't mean they are not a cogwheel in another setting. Right? So our sense of agency is not an end all and be all. It's not like I have an agency score of like, 8 out of 10 and Nigel's is like 7 out of 10 and in all aspects of his life he's a 7 out of 10 agency person sometimes at work we feel we're 3 out of 10 but in our social setting or our home we feel like we're 8 out of 10 so I think having people kind of understand that there are always varying um, degrees of agency um, helps but also that you don't have to feel this high sense of I must be a change maker and like I need to go back with like a to-do list because depending on why you go to a room um, I was recently um, speaking at a keynote with one of the ministries and I had a, a, a co-keynote speaker and he was, um, he was sharing that he um, cannot understand what he calls the Fox News people. Okay? He really struggles with that. And so, so what he says, what he does is every day he watches Fox News in, in a bit to try and kind of unpack it for himself and kind of figure out where this, this, this dissonance is for him. Um, because he feels like when he addresses these people, he feels like he, he, he toggles between an underminer and going like, I give up, I give up, I cannot change anything. Because he's, he's, So he's firmly in the grey zone. And he logically, because his daughter is a social justice um, advocate in the States, he, he feels like he needs to move himself into the maybe can category. Um, and he does it by, by educating himself or, or trying to see things from different perspectives. And sometimes, depending on the unconference, the person can choose to like, oh, this is a topic. Um, and let me just go and see how, I don't really think it's going to be feasible, but then let me, I, let me just go and take a look. And, and maybe in that specific room, there's a certain sense that it's a cog, I'm a cogwheel in, in this topic.
but I just want to listen to anyway. Right? So this is really the spectrum of how our sense of agency can shift depending on where we are, who we are, why we are. Um, and we're just going to take you into how do you then allow people to build a sense of agency, which means how do we then move people from grey zones into yellow zones and from yellow zones into pink zones. Okay, so on building a sense of agency, there are a few ways that we can, that we can go about it. Um, the f obviously, if, obviously, in an ideal situation, we would like to go into dialogue where everybody is comfortable and, and you're able to say, okay, so what are your thoughts? And everybody shares it freely. But something, and, and in, a best case, in a best case situation, wow, everybody's on the same page. And, and, we, go, and we go into act, which is, uh, so where do we, okay, we know what the issue is. We all agree on this thing. What can we do about it? And then the, the, the whole, whole time in, in the room is really action, top, planning action. That is your most incredible, wonderful situation. But, but sometimes it actually goes into, in, it starts in the exact opposite direction where really the person who comes up with the idea and, 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 and is in charge of room really wants to vent. Or in Singapore, in Singapore, in Singaporean terms, we well, like to complain. And, and that's what the session literally starts with. Uh, my good friend Akol would say, yeah, Singapore's number one activity, complain. And, but what's most important ab about this complaining is not just to let the person complain until, until they feel happy that they've complained to an audience, but rather getting, the, getting everybody else in the room to listen to that venting and really listen and ask, what is the basis behind this complaint, this, this venting? What are the issues that are out there? I guess we can say that if people are in the grey zone, the cockwheels and the you know, underminers, a lot of them, their first mode of engagement could be to vent. And um, we don't like to talk about venting or complaining and it comes to facilitation. It feels like a taboo thing to talk about. But I really wanted to take this chance for us to kind of experience that. Um, since we all, all of us have a pet peeve of something, right? I, I will start, my, my pet peeve is um, people with very fancy cars parking in wheelchair lots. And I, 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 I sit at, like sometimes I sit at the terrace when I'm having dinner and then I see like a really cool, I don't know, Lamborghini or whoever comes in and they're like, oh, see, wheelchair lot, no one's there. And then they park there. And it re really bothers me. Like, I want to take a photo. I want to stop them. I want to go to like, the security guard and like, guys, what if like a car comes in and like they need this lot? Clearly these two people in the Lamborghini do not need this, this disabled lot. And then there are all these issues, right? And then when the security guard tells me, oh, you know, ma'am, I'm sorry, you know, I can't really do very much. I feel even angrier. And, you know, then I feel like I, I you know, I feel like I, I just want to do something not very nice. And then it, I struggle with this. So that's my, my, my pet peeve, right? The idea of all Our this. call will say, can, he will take direct action with his agency, but will not tell you what he's going to do. <laughs> okay, so what I, want, what I want you guys to do now is kind of, can I just shout out loud and I'm going to get um, Nikki to kind of help me to annotate on the slide. Um, for us to kind of figure out what we want to talk about. So if you can all just share your pet peeve, either on the chat, either type it out on the chat, or you can just kind of take turns and verbalize, what is this like one thing that happens in Singapore that really gets your goat, right? I mean, to be fair, most people that come and attend TVC things are very in the yellow and pink zone, now, okay? I'll be honest, most, most people are there. Um, and we try not to vent because we feel like not very constructive. So let's just help, help, you know, we unpack it in our heads. We unconference ourselves before we, it comes out of our mouth. But we'll pretend that we, we are not quite as, as polite. What, are the, what is your pet peeve? Like the one thing, whether in Singapore or in the world, that, that gets your goat, right? So, so for me, it's, it's parking in disabled spaces. Every time I see it, I feel like, like my hair stands and I, 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 I become this other being <laughs> of <laughs> angst. Um, Anybody else? Can I just have, do you have a pet peeve, Mark, Nigel? 
Oh, oh, just, oh, just share, share one, one, oh, one pet peeve. Oh, oh, We're sharing yeah. one pet peeve, guys, okay? <laughs> one, one. I know, you know, this is, you know, one pet peeve, okay? I don't want to open a can of worms. Okay, one pet peeve. Or if someone is happy to raise their hand and then we can go to you. Wow. Okay, guys, I have issues, okay? So, you guys go ahead first. Can somebody else just share your one, your one, your one pet peeve? I mean, I have many. Okay, yeah. same thing here. Yeah, I think mine was I just um, went through this injustice. You know, when people talk about poverty, they think it's like, um, they would think it's like, uh, let them be away from, uh, I mean, they get financial assistance, but I think it's injustice. Some of us can say we want to do this, we want to do that, but actually we practice double standard. So double standard and injustice. Hey, <laughs> can you give us a, can you just give us okay, a, a, um, a, like a scenario? Okay, since this is safe, level since two, this level two, level one scenario, okay? Level two, okay. no, 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 I, I can level do... three because recorded better not level three. Okay, I can do so called level one and level two. It's just okay. that um, we are trying to encourage and um, uh, so called recruit people from our community. Okay, so we give them a little bit of stipends or, or salary by, by recruiting them as screeners. All right. But then when they, uh, we also at the same time, we're trying to encourage them to increase their seasonal participation. So they do that on their off days or the days they're not working. So, but then there was an issue that someone in the community, uh, the family got COVID. And so uh, there was a question, why are you doing uh, um, groundwork or community work? And uh, you never tell me that you're doing, if you're so free, then why don't you work? So that really kind of pissed me off because there's injustice, right? You're not practicing what you're preaching. So that's the example that I'm quoting. Okay, cool. I understand that. Thank Are you, you ready with your no. pet peeve? Okay. So next person, clearly Nigel's trying to sift through his 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 <laughs> list of pet peeves. Anybody else? What is your pet peeve? I can go next. Okay, cool. Um, Did I tell you you have a wonderful name? I think it's like it's beautiful. I might be mildly of biased. Of course, you would think that. <laughs> but yes, but yes. Okay. Yes, so my pet is uh, people. Okay, people riding the bicycle on the pedestrian path. It scares me. Ah, it's like, oh okay. man, I will always make way for them, but it's like, whoa, you know, it's a vehicle. A bicycle is a vehicle. Maybe you might want to try the road. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. Okay, that's and it. I got my pet peeve. Okay. Okay. Ah. Is your pet peeve having to wait? Because it's very... <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Let's get a few more. Okay, you can go, you can go. Okay. So my pet peeve, right, is when people take their books <laughs> and they break the spine of the book to open it up. Ah, and, and, and on top of that, they tell me this is perfectly acceptable. Worse yet, they desecrate this book, which is a sick, someone has taken effort to publish and write this book. And then they scribble on the book. Wait, are we talking about lit books here? No, or is it, are we excluding literature books? We are excluding literature books where you have no choice but, but general, general story books. Okay. And I know a group of people who are shamelessly unapologetic about it. Well, I mean, this is level two, right? Yes. <laughs> level two, okay, I'm glad it's level two. So no names are required. Great, so breaking of book spines. Excellent. I mean, it clearly bothers him. <laughs> are you adding Are you adding to that pet peeve or do you have a, a bigger pet peeve that we want to talk about, Nikki? Oh, I'm, I'm a little bit like Nigel. There's, there's a few that get my goat. So I'm trying to sift through the one that is most relevant. <laughs> I mean, I know Nigel fairly well. I did not think this would be the one he's going to bring up. But okay, clearly. <laughs> there's a reason also why I don't borrow books from Nigel. Yeah. Or offer to lend him mine. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, Doug, Justin? Oh. Ken Bing guess, or uh, maybe along uh, Cynthia's line of, uh, you know, people not always getting uh, treated uh, well, I always feel like our our society's view of migrant workers, which has improved, I think, since COVID, and also domestic workers, they're seen as lesser, I think, and that's really unfortunate. And an example, even from our neighborhood, is we have a monthly thing where anyone who wants can come and uh, we clean up, like just clean up the neighborhood, right? It's just like a little neighborhood cleanup thing. And a bunch of people, after they heard this and saw this, said, we should pay our cleaners less money because we're doing their work. 
And like that kind of thing is just like the mental model that would go behind somebody saying that wow. is wow. just astounding, wow. right? I mean, these are not millionaires. I mean, the amount of money they make, as we all know, is so low. And so it's the it's the the mindset that people have that these are wow. you know, lesser than I really feel like lesser human beings or something. Yeah. And it's, I think it's quite unfortunate. Wow. I know we made a lot of progress and I think we have a long way to go uh, to see them, wow. uh, you know, make them feel like this is a home, you know. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing. They, they, that help, they, build, they help. They take care of our families. They build our country. Right. And um, they're here for a few years. And yeah. That would be Justin mine. or uh, Agnes Kenbing or Lipsin, anybody want to share your pet peeve? Justin, you must have one. Uh, yeah, so my pet peeve, uh, and this has been for about uh, a year plus, ever since I started uh, going to the gym, right? And um, it's when we get the towel from the counter, right? Uh, when, when, <sighs> when people are done with it, they just leave it on the benches in the locker room. There is a very clearly demarcated area where they can <laughs> put their towels into the into the basket, but they don't do it. They just leave it on the benches. You know, I cannot understand why would they do such a thing. And it just piles up. You no know, people put their towels, their used clothes, and it's like it's so unhygienic, dirty, and and I thought it would get better like when COVID's happening, right? Like okay, you know, hygiene will be a parity and paramount in everyone's mind. No, it still carries on. I have no idea why why that keeps going on. Yeah. Fascinating. That's a pet peeve. Wow. Okay. Thank, thank okay. you, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Justin. Okay. Justin, Agnes, wait, wait. Justin's one has has helped me narrow down my my. Pet okay. Peeve. <laughs> you want to go? You want to go? <laughs> yeah. This is not in the spirit of Singaporean, but it's part of the reason why I don't like driving is people who don't indicate. Yes. They are either changing lanes <laughs> or or turning a corner, like we are just supposed to guess what they are going to do next. It drives me crazy. Yeah. I apologize on behalf of Southeast Asians everywhere. Cle clearly you need to put a plus one because Douglas is like, yeah, I'm putting <laughs> half a vote there for sure. Um, Agnes, um, Lip, can I have one of you guys share before we, we close off this, this segment and then we'll, we'll talk about it? Yeah, uh, can you hear me? My pet peeve is yes. really about littering, yeah. Uh, especially like HDB um, and um, like people who litter at the playgrounds and leave all their food and, and uh, yeah stuff on the play structures and leave their, their all their yeah whatever that they litter after eating at the void deck and stuff like that. So always I don't know if it's just a problem in my neighborhood, but it's a very new neighborhood and yet uh, people are just like treating it like a yeah rubbish. Rubbish is everywhere. I don't know why. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else before we, we kind of okay. narrow down from here? Uh, yeah, okay. can I add on? Yes. Yes. I'm yeah. trying to figure out who's... Is it Ken Bing? Ken okay, that's the Ken Bing first. Okay. Uh, my script, but I'm, my don't worry about it. Swollen. Yeah, yeah. No worries. No worries. Are you okay? Is your okay. eyes... Yeah, yeah, are yeah. All... Okay, okay, cool. I'm all right, to let's cut have you share. Time. Yeah, I think what Nikki uh, shared also triggered me in a bit because... Uh, uh, it's about, for example, if I'm a load driving or riding, then whenever the green light uh, is on, I mean, it's from a traffic light, when the light turns from red to green or whenever there's a jam, you know, and, and the, when, the, when the traffic in front is slightly clear, then everyone at the back expects the one in front to immediately drive off. Very impatient, kind, then horn and beep, you know. To me, it's like, A, I need some reaction time, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. That's mine. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Lipsin, uh, okay, you're our last. Yeah, um, I, I, join, I, I joined the, um, the event just a bit uh, halfway through, so a bit lost. But okay, I think I get the idea. I, there's one that I came across previously. There's a, a, a person I know who worked in a, in a company um, where the, there is um, um, an unwritten rule for them to not work on, the, on their birthday. So if um, oh. uh, whatever day your birthday falls on, you have to take leave or off on that day, you shouldn't be coming to work. And it becomes something, it becomes an unwritten rule that, that is, um, becomes false on them. I mean, what's yes. wrong with working on the holiday, or on, the, on your birthday? Right. Mm. So, um, but uh, I said, okay, la, but you, if you don't want, then you just don't take law, but you know, cannot, cannot, because the, the my, my, no, that, that friend says, nah, it's just uh, too much for him to bear because he becomes the odd one out in the in an organization of oh. maybe about eight hundred wow. staff all together. Wow. Yeah. I understand. Cool. 
Okay, so we look at all the, anybody else? I think everybody has, everybody has shared. If you look at the list that we have, um, maybe we can collectively kind of do this. Can we kind of put things together? I think there is definitely injustice is definitely one, one chunk. That it happens is, is something that we, we, don't, we don't like. Um, the other one seems to be not following rules mm -hmm. or social norms. It's almost like we created group norms and then we decided to flout it. Right, we agree that, you know, must put towels back and then you don't. Um, and then can anybody else, can we see if we can narrow down and kind of chunk them together? Because breaking yeah, books fines is the same, right? Rather than, than I mean, when you were describing group norms, I think norms is kind of selfishness. Yes, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, okay, I think we can, maybe we can slash because it's like you, there's an expectation and then a choice to not, to not follow what, what is expected, right? Okay. All right, so can we just kind of, can we put the number on the other side of the screen just so that it doesn't confuse if you don't mind? Just room one, room two. I think we can kind of have three rooms maybe. Yeah. You think three rooms? Awesome. Um, maybe we can collectively decide which, what we want to name the three rooms, guys, if we come together. So injustice is definitely one. Uh, rule two, the number two is, um, I think, rules and expectations. Yep. And then what will be the third? Consideration, you think? Consideration? Common, uh, common space sharing. Ah, common space sharing, yeah. Because yeah, even, even like asking the guy to drive off an expectation, yeah. that's, that's just... Um, okay. So, um, there'll be three rooms. Um, and then we're just going to go into a very short breakout room, uh, breakout to kind of... To do this, so I think the whole the whole example of the fist. I mean, just take a meta position is um, if you notice. I mean, because I planned this obviously, so I my my vent was very clear. Um, when people want to share the vent, sometimes there are a few ways they are very shy to share. They feel bad. It's like oh my god, I I, I cannot say all these things that I'm unhappy about, right? Um, and then they are like, oh, nah, any, I, but never mind, never mind, I, I try. And then you get those who are like, no, 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 I've got pet peeve. I tell you my pet peeve, and I'm very forceful about it. And then the third is they vent, but they feel like they have to explain why they are venting and explain for people, right? So the, the aim of a vent for people who may not have been able to kind of dissect what they think into like, oh, I think this is a, a justice issue, is really for the room to kind of hear the vent, let it out, let it go, but also for the facilitator, which is all of you, to kind of figure out and help them to like, oh, do you mean... And then sometimes it comes out in a story, like, t tell me a story of what happened. That, oh, I went to the gym and this happened. Or I went to the road and this happened. Um, and it's sometimes understanding, I guess, why people do things makes, makes a world of difference. But okay, so we have three breakout rooms. Yep. Um, Nikki's going to set them up. And then you guys are going to just go into the breakout room of your choice. If you decide to stay in the main room, there's Nikki anyway and she'll be happy to... Or should we just keep break the main room as one? Then the other two, then people can come in and out. Would that work? Okay, Okay. so um, the main room will just be breakout room one. So Nikki, I'm sorry, you're just stuck with injustice. Uh, <laughs> none of this book spine, book spine discussion for you and Nigel. Um, but room uh, breakout, so the first breakout room would be rules and social expectations, and then the next one would be common space. So if you guys could just, um, you'll see it come up. Um, which one, where should we attend? Douglas, um, Nigel will pick one. I'll go anywhere. Okay. Ladies first. Yeah, okay. So the, um, everyone just pick a room, either stay. If you're going to stay, just write the word I'm staying. And then if not, go to room uh, one or two. Right? Ladies' choice, read. Popping into the injustice room and letting Nikki know that she's not happy with it. And then letting Nikki know that she's not happy with it. Okay. Doug's back. Okay. Cool. Can we, shall we do. Injustice is going to stay. So we, where we, can we go common space? Let's go, to, let's go to two. Let's go to the common space. Yeah. Yes. So injustice is... Oh, it is now? Okay, then we'll just leave it. Nikki, sorry. Okay. <laughs> oh, I don't get to No. No. Um, no, what we meant was the main room is going to be the injustice room. So if, you're not, if you don't go to a room, by default, you will just stay in injustice. If you go to room one, it'll be rules and social expectations. And then room two will be common space sharing. Yep. Okay? So again, if you stay, it's injustice. 
Room one is rules and social expectations, and in room two is common space sharing. So Douglas, you need to, to leave injustice and stay in the room. Okay, we're going to go to... Uh, okay, we'll go to rules and social expectations, because this is just, just in there. Okay. okay, we'll go there. Okay, have a good discussion, guys. If not, they'll stay in the, the, in the injustice room anyway. Yes. Sounds a bit about like um, social responsibility, the idea of, of the community you know, being uh, bigger than the self, and then looking out for each other a little bit more. So you're recognizing that because it is somewhat of a common space still, uh, you, you, you aware, you're aware that whatever you do is not just your own actions and for your own, for your own uh, self-satisfying purposes. Yeah, so, so I find it a bit strange. Like, even say gym, right, locker rooms, uh, the, the reluctance to actually just return the towels, right? Just on a, a presumption that firstly, either uh, someone is there to pick up after me. Uh, secondly, uh, it is a common space. Therefore, I, it doesn't matter to anyone else, actually. You know, I can mm. do whatever I want. And thirdly, maybe, oh, I paid for my membership, you know, and that's why it's fine. So it, it's like how if you want to translate the, the entire uh, analogy into Singapore society, right? Oh, I paid my taxes now. I can do whatever I want. Okay, society is much larger. I don't owe society anything. Now. I can just do whatever I want. Yeah, and then you just like what, things. It's kind of like what I think someone said, right? I mean, oh, if, if we clean up the space, then we should pay our cleaners less because clearly you have to do less work. It's this equivalent of, of I guess, value of, of work and, and how they view the value of a space as well, you know? But I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm interested to see why is it that we... We feel this way. Why the Singaporeans? Is it is it a, is it a Singapore thing? Is it a, a us thing? How can we? I mean, we don't do that at home, right? So why is it that we do that when we're in public? I don't know. There was this strange logic that was presented to me, and I hear it over and over. Oh, if we clean up after ourselves, then the cleaners got no job. Really? Yeah. Sorry. I heard, I heard really? that. Yeah, yeah. I heard that, yeah. Especially for the hawker centers. What do you think? Uh, I, I do agree because I think it's like, uh, I'm just thinking like, you know, if there's like a, like a, a message that, uh, that people uh, have to look at, say everywhere, you know, in the focus center, like make this your, like your own home. Yeah, then it might be a good reminder for people to, to sort of like be more considerate. Yeah. But on mm. the other hand, I'm also thinking that Maybe sometimes for some people it's really they just don't don't see it as part of their space. Yeah. It's mm. like, you know, I'm just concerned about doing my own thing and that I'm not gonna change my mind no matter what you tell me. So how do we like keep these people uh how, how do we still involve these people? Like? Yeah, because we, we can't we can't control what, what these other people do. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's why the common Singapore way is behavior change through the hard way. Oh, oh the fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, I feel that children in our society are not really treated as human beings in some cases. Mm. We, we expect, I mean, as adults, we have bad days. We have days that we don't want to eat something. We don't feel like mm. doing anything. We have days that we just want to watch TV, we have bad moods. But children are not kind of allowed to have those kind of behaviors. Children are not allowed to throw tantrums. We tell them, cannot cry. Um, you must be constant, you must do homework every day. You know, that kind of thing. Mm. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I guess this just stems from me being someone, because I work with children and I feel that a lot of parents and a, a lot of caregivers, teachers, a lot of adults in children's lives are, are actually very disrespecting of them. Yeah, and I feel bad for the kids. So mm. I, I feel that this is a kind of injustice that, that is really um, not being addressed in our society. Mm. Yeah. It sounds like it's come from uh, um, wanting them to be very conformist, wanting children to be all, to start out being very conformist. Of course, once you are out of school, it's up to you, but it seems but that I the prevalent like... thought is that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, as adults, yeah. We, we, we tend uh, to have expectations of children. Yeah. Yeah, I feel uh, which that. Which may not be re yeah. reasonable. 
Correct. I feel that we do not treat them as equal. I mean, I'm. I don't mean it in a wrong way. I know that we are. Uh, we 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 are. We there's definitely de different developmental stage. But when I say equal, is that we do not practice the 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 values, uh, and we don't share the same values. So you just say, for example, I'm tired. Then if when a child is tired, we don't even consider because we say. We know when you're tired, when you're hungry, you shouldn't even do that just because we are the parent or the older ones. So I don't think it's uh, more of that. I think it's that we really take them for granted and we do not think that they have uh, the capacity to feel to even exercise what they want to do. So that's when we think we know what's best for them. So that, that kind of angle. So sometimes we do kind of impose on them things that we can't even practice ourselves. So I think that's it. To me, that's the, the mindset of uh, might be cultural and might be historical habits of uh, intergenerational uh, traditions and all that that's coming down from our parenting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like how all three rooms actually ended up, land, the landing point seems to be the idea of agency. I don't think we planned it, but in the first room, we talked about migrant workers and kids. And I think it was very clear with the kids one is, why is it that we don't give them a sense of agency and then we, we, we expect adults to have that and kids not? And then when it comes to the letterboxes, right, it means we can't change someone else's sense of who, how yeah. they feel, but what we can do with our agency is to role model and to do something. And then in, in our room, we talked about how then can we empower people to act um, in, in a manner? Um, but really, we, we, we wanted to just kind of also model. I, I love the discussion, so thank you very much. I, I, there was a lot of... I, I was really stunned by some of the things I learned um, in, in the room that I was in. So thank you, thank you, Justin and, and Nigel. Um, but we really want to kind of wrap up and, and see where agency is, right? And you realise that we see the sense of agency in many aspects in our lives, not just in an unconference. Right? And the reason why we believe the unconference is such a powerful medium for us to have a dialogue, a discussion, even to land on an action point, is, is really because people can talk. So, I mean, for example, this was session one, right? Or before lunch kind of break for an unconference. Um, the room that had Douglas that talked about migrant workers and kids could actually, in real life, split into two subgroups and go kids, migrant workers, for example. So as a facilitator, you can you can really kind of key into what the room is talking about. And if you feel like there's, they're starting to split into another two kind of subgroups, the beautiful thing about the unconference is that open another room, mm -hmm. which means all the people are like, I don't talk about kids, huh? and then they can go to room four, and then those that want to stay and continue the migrant worker conversation, because they're both really exciting, um, but can hold its own weight, then you can allow it to kind of split very organically. And that's the, that's the beauty of an unconference because you are also then able to exercise your agency and saying, guys, I want to open a new room to talk about kids and agency, thanks. Yep. And then you can go do that. Right. So, so if you notice, um, to link it back to the earlier concepts of open space technology, yeah, the topics are created first in the marketplace of ideas. But even after that, if during the course of a conversation in a, in a room that's created, you realise that there are two groups um, going in two, diff two different but important directions, you can, you can actually then split that, that room further into two separate rooms so that the conversation can be more, more targeted and more targeted. In, in an unconference, you may want to... It's also possible that you, every time you kind of switch to new topics, but sometimes the topic is so compelling for the people in the room, they just really want to talk about it, or as, as it happens, it kind of segues quite nicely, and then you can do that. But the, these questions that we have um, shared with you are really the questions that um, we encourage anyone mm. who is facilitating an unconference uh, to really think about. Um, not so much as a participant. I think it's very different. I mean, the whole Zoom in us about uh, to raise facilitators for unconferences. The first question is really, what am I here for? And that means as a facilitator. If you're coming in with a direct, like, I want my guys in this room to have this landing point, then that's not an unconference. Um, you know, yeah. the spirit of it. The idea is, as a facilitator, you are as much part of the process, this openness, um, as, as the next person, right? So the first question I would ask, if you're thinking of facilitating an open space, um, is what am I here for? To be honest, it is not an end-all and be-all. It's not conference versus unconference. There are many occasions where you can have conference in the morning, unconference in the afternoon. 
things like that. So you can have a hybrid. But the question that you should always ask as a facilitator in either of the events, even in a conference, is what am I here for? If you're there because your boss says you must go and facilitate, then perhaps that's your sense of agency or lack thereof. Um, but that's a good question for all of us as facilitators to ask. Yeah. Uh, the other one, who do I represent? What hat do I wear or am, or am, or am I wearing? I think that's one of the important, important considerations. Well, to answer that question, the hat you're wearing is really the hat of, of the question that was, that was asked in the room that you're facilitating. So what you're, wear what you're wearing is what we like to call, I do believe my friend coined it as, you're an intelligent know-nothing. You, you know nothing about the topic, and, and you're there to listen to listen to the to the thoughts and opinions that are coming out and help the whole group sense me. So that's the hat that you're wearing. And if you have an opinion of the matter, then you are part of the group. I think it also is in real life format. I mean, kind of the hat we wear at work, right? I mean, are you wearing your teacher hat, your mother hat, your boss hat, your uh, coffee uncle hat, you know, whatever it is? That that's the literal. Um, and, and sometimes you react differently, right? So if you, for example, are a, a civil servant and you attend a session and in your back, you're like, ah, I cannot, that policy cannot, lah. Ah, yeah, I know this, this happening, then that's not also useful um, for the session or as a facilitator if you're going to buy. Actually, yeah, guys, you should just be away because you know, it's not going to work. Um, so I guess the, the unconference ethos really says everyone go in, just kind of leave your hats at the door yeah. and then just go in. So the third question we want to pose to you guys is why does this matter and why should this matter? Why should this unconference matter? Why should this room matter? Why should these people matter? These are questions that as a facilitator, we would love you to ponder on. And it could be, why should this matter? Oh, it doesn't. Then maybe the room is not for you. And exercise that agency saying, can I swap with somebody else? Uh, or you're allotted to room one, but room three is like you're burning to go there and see if you can swap. I mean, these are things that, that happen as well. Um, the conversations that take place, always ask yourself, if it's something you don't really know about and you're happy to go with the flow, why should this matter? Why does this topic on, let's say, kids and agency, why does it matter to these 20 people who are now in the room? Mm. right? Or the two people who are now in the room, why does that matter? Because the question of why does it matter is a question that you're answering for yourself. Because yeah. it obviously matters. Because there are, say, 15, 20 people in the room who are interested in this topic and want to talk about it. And so you have to gain, you have to sense being out of, out of the opinions of those 20 people uh, why this matters to you and, and what you can do to help them get something out of this session as well. Um, of course, um, as Sherry mentioned, uh, when we put up all the ideas, if, if we are making you a facilitator, we do try to give people choice of where they yes. want to facilitate. But sometimes, you know, you end up in a room that you don't really have an opinion on. And that's when you have to exercise your facilitator skills and experience. <laughs> so I think the question I also like to ask um, my facilitators when I work with them is, what can I, how might I take what I've gleaned today so that my tomorrow will look slightly different? Um, our unconference is called a nudge forward. We're not looking for like monumental change, you know, like, wow, we can, we can rewrite how things are done. Um, and I think realistically, we're just looking for people who just want to nudge things forward, right? So how can we learn, even today? I mean, I've learned things today that, that I think I will have to sit with. Um, I call it sit with the ick. Um, I sit with things that I'm comfortable with to kind of just kind of figure out how I feel about it. But how might you take what you glean today in whatever room, whatever form, whatever learning, that your tomorrow will look slightly different? It could be as simple as realizing that it is brave to ride a roller coaster, and it's also brave to not ride a roller coaster. Right? It could be. It could be that. Sherry is the bravest non roller coaster rider I know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I've always said that I, I've got immense fears. But um, and the last question is really, what story do I know? I, this is this came from a book, a children's book, a young young reader's book actually called The Elementals. And in the story is there are Scotch dragons and ice wolves. So like this, you're either like a dragon tribe or like the wolf tribe or like the humans lah. And in, in the story, the, the, the way the dragons are raised is based on what they, they know. And one of them is one of this girl who's in, she's a trainee dragon and she's the story keeper, right? And her, her, her job is to go and find all these stories of the wolves and the dragons and like archive them. And her ethos with storytelling is, what is the story I know? Which is great, the story that you know. 
but then always ask, what is the other related stories that you don't know? And why is it you have never heard of it? And it was a line that, I mean, it was, it was part of the book where they were kind of still world building and it really stuck with me um, because it really made me realize that the narratives that we tell ourselves, we come in with bias, right? And if, we're, if we are only focused on what we know and not open to all the things that we possibly could not know, then we, we will never grow as people. And the added question that I've learned and it's very uncomfortable to ask is, why is it that I've never learned about that? Is it I don't know? Is it I'm unaware? Is it I'm uh, sheltered? Is it I bo chap? Is it, you know, there are all these reasons, right? But they're important for us. And as a facilitator, it is one of the most powerful things is asking, I'm hearing Nigel's story, but what is the story I'm not hearing? And why is it that I've never heard that side? And like, these, are, these are the things that I think makes a facilitator naturally curious. I think a lot of us who are here and, and keen to be facilitators, they naturally are. Um, because we will always say that if you're facilitating from a point of power, then it's actually a very unfun facilitator. <laughs> it's a, it'll be a very unfun sit, um, experience for you. Um, but really, I think facilitators, the more curious and more like, oh, really? I never knew that you are, it actually makes for a, a, a really fun experience. And what makes it an incredible experience is if you're able to do that for the rest of the people in the room as well. So it's not just that aha moment for you of learning a new story or seeing a new perspective as a facilitator, but also getting everybody in the room to, to recognize the different stories and different perspectives that are coming out, even though they came together for a common idea. And I think just to wrap up, that's really the beauty of why we believe in the unconference and why we believe in open, open space technology. Um, I will be upfront. My, my biggest um, application of the open space ever since I've encountered it years ago is in, in unconferencing the self, right? It's, it's a journey that I, I'm still on, but I, I find that, that that intrigues me, people who constantly unpack their world and unpack how they think. Um, I'm going to ask Nikki to go to the next slide because we have a very important date for all of you um, we have had three uh, Zoom in us, so thank you so much for, for watching, tuning in, for, for, find, for getting us to even have the series because it was born out of someone, many people asking, can we have a kind of like a train of facilitator, kind of pre-seminar. Um, our main conference is on the 25th of September. Uh, details uh, for registration will come up on the slide after this. But before I go to that, or that slide, I'm going to ask anybody else in the room, do you have any last things you would like to say, share, or like comment before we, we close for the day? Anybody? If not, can I just have a thumbs up from everyone who is like, I'm great, I'm going to hold my peace. Just waiting for all good. Right, yeah. if not, thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. A reminder, if you, if you're good, if you listen to this and you go, Oh, I have friends who missed out the first two Zoominas. Don't worry, we will put up all three Zoominas on our Facebook page so that you can re-watch it. As many times as you need. Yes. Uh, tell your friends to watch it as well and if they have no idea what an unconference is. And please, join us on the 25th of September for the unconference. It'll be fun. And our, top, and our theme for the unconference is... A nudge forward. So, thank you very much. We'll see you next month. Bye! Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.